Hi, welcome to a talk on RF and microwave engineering. I'm Steve Ellingson, and I am an associate professor of electrical and computer engineering at Virginia Tech. This talk is for undergraduates in electrical engineering who are curious about the RF and microwave engineering field, and who would like to know a little bit more about what goes on in this field and what it takes to follow this particular career path. So the first question to answer should be, what uh, the heck do we mean by RF and microwave engineering? Well, there's a couple ways to answer that question. One way is to call out some of the applications that are associated with RF and microwave technology. Prominent among these applications is communications. For example, wireless telecom, in particular cellular phone technology, wireless local area networks, and satellite communications. Another important class of applications includes radars. And I'm showing here a military phased array radar and uh, also navigation, including especially GPS. An important class of RF and microwave applications that you might not immediately think of is medical imaging. Here I'm showing an MRI machine. MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. And an MRI machine is essentially a gigantic magnet combined with a radar. Yet another class of applications that you might not immediately think of is radio science, including radio astronomy and geophysics. By geophysics, I mean things like weather radar and satellites that observe the Earth at radio frequencies in support of things like climate forecasting. In the middle here, I'm showing an RFID tag. RFID stands for Radio Frequency Identification. This little guy is an RFID tag that consists of a tiny chip located right here in the center, and the entire rest of the structure is an antenna. RFID is primarily about inventory control and also used for things like parking garage access. So for example, the hang tag in my parking permit here at Virginia Tech has one of these things embedded in it, and it's how a closed gate knows to open when I approach and I'm authorized to be there. Let me emphasize that these are merely examples of applications and certainly not an exhaustive list. Another way to answer the question, what is RF and microwave, is in terms of what RF and microwave engineers do. And here are some examples. A lot of RF and microwave engineers work on RF devices and on circuits that perform RF functions. Other RF and microwave engineers work on applications, which you can think of as ways to assemble circuits and devices into working systems and providing the support to customers that do these things. So for example, radios. There are other RF and microwave engineers who never touch hardware and don't do circuit design. A broad class of these jobs is essentially software development. And yet another broad class of these jobs involves the analysis of RF signals. For example, as in RF spectrum monitoring and RF spectrum planning. While these jobs don't necessarily involve RF hardware directly, they do require a working knowledge of RF principles. So RF and microwave engineering education is certainly important for this class of applications as well. So what specifically does it mean for something to be RF or for something to be microwave? Let's define some terms. When we say RF, we mean radio frequency. And those are frequencies ranging from kilohertz to terahertz, a very wide range of frequencies. But the term RF, the way we're using it here, is not really about frequency specifically. When we say RF, it usually means pertaining to or in support of radio. And when we say radio, we mean it in a very broad sense, covering all the applications I described on the previous slide, and generally involving in some way electromagnetic waves, which are either guided or unguided. The term microwave refers to frequencies greater than about 300 megahertz. The free space wavelength at 300 megahertz is about one meter, which means that the dimensions of circuits and circuit boards becomes a significant fraction of the wavelength. As frequency goes up, wavelength decreases. So at higher frequencies, a circuit board may be many wavelengths across. As a result, the geometry of the circuit matters. 
You can no longer assume, for example, that the voltage at one end of a printed circuit board trace is equal to the voltage at the other end of a circuit board trace. And you need to take that into account. If you're not prepared to do that, then this becomes a serious impediment. However, RF and microwave engineers know all about these goofy behaviors. And furthermore, they know how to exploit this behavior to do some truly amazing things. You see, microwave circuits and devices don't always follow the rules of sophomore level circuit theory. For example, energy can be exchanged without physical connection. We can send signals between antennas and we don't need to have them connected together using wires. Also, voltage and current signals travel as waves. So these behaviors enable all kinds of useful things and these things can seem almost magical. Here's an example of some everyday RF magic. The circuit board shown on this slide contains only two connectors. There's a connector there, and a connector there, and some metal between them. On the circuit board, there are no discrete components. In particular, there are no inductors and no capacitors, just metal. Take a look at these three traces, the ones I'm indicating here. Each one of these ends in a set of vias, and these vias are plated through holes, which connect the top of the board to the bottom of the board, which is a continuous ground plane. That is, the ends of each one of these traces is shorted to the ground. So from a non-RF, low-frequency, analog perspective, this board seems not to do anything, because the input and output are literally shorted to ground. At microwave frequencies, however, this thing is a filter. Nothing is shorted out because all the signals exist as waves on the circuit board traces. The vias are just places where the waves get reflected. If you choose the lengths of these traces correctly and arrange the geometry in the right way, you end up with a filter. The response of this filter is shown in the blue inset here. The three traces here account for the bandpass behavior shown here. And there's one other trace over here, which in fact ends in an open circuit, and that accounts for the notch seen in the frequency response of this filter right there. So by choosing lengths and terminations correctly, you can design bandpass filters with notches. So what we've done here is we've created a filter using only the circuit board traces and no inductors and no capacitors. Now, as cool as that might be, you might ask the question, why not just use inductors and capacitors anyway? After all, they would typically be smaller, for example. And that's true. The answer is that capacitors and inductors behave in significantly non-ideal ways at microwave frequencies. That is, they become difficult to use at frequencies of interest here. And this is a UHF band filter going up uh, around a one gigahertz on the high end. Another answer is that this is essentially free. We're just putting metal on a printed circuit board and chances are the rest of the system would go on the same printed circuit board. So there might not be any additional cost in implementing this filter in this manner, whereas there would be if we were adding discrete components. Once the frequency becomes sufficiently high, the size of the structure becomes sufficiently small because wavelength decreases with increasing frequency. And then this approach of using microstrip lines becomes very attractive because it's essentially free and bypasses the headaches associated with discrete components at microwave frequencies. Another way to think about this field of RF or microwave engineering is in terms of the Venn diagram I'm showing here. And I think broadly in terms of this area being four sub areas, namely systems, devices, circuits, and physics. So this is just a way to describe the kinds of things that happen in RF and microwave engineering in yet a different way. It's a Venn diagram. So these four things overlap each other. So Certainly, there are problems which involve combinations of circuits and systems. There are problems which involve combinations of circuits and physics. There are problems which involve combinations of devices and physics, and so on. Nevertheless, if I just think about systems, here are some things that come to mind. I mentioned wireless communications already. 
and GPS already, and radar. Under radar, we have military and aviation radar. We have geophysical radar, that is weather radar. We have automotive radar, which is becoming increasingly common. We have security radar, for example, the screening systems that you walk through at a transportation security agency checkpoint in an airport. And we have now radars for health applications. So for example, there are radar systems being designed for nursing homes that are capable of detecting uh, when one of the residents has fallen, for example. I mentioned magnetic resonance imaging, and I mentioned radio frequency identification previously. But yet another system that you might not think of is a microwave oven which, as indicated in the name, is obviously a RF or microwave system. And, of course, we could continue this list uh, almost indefinitely. Next, you might think in terms of circuits. RF circuits include linear amplifiers and power amplifiers. They include circuits for frequency synthesis, including oscillators and synthesizers. RF circuits include filters. And as I mentioned in a previous slide, we might think in terms of those filters being discrete combinations of inductances and capacitances, or we might think of filters as being distributed structures consisting of, for example, microstrip transmission lines. And there are many other ways to design filters using things, for example, like material resonances. An important class of RF microwave engineering circuits includes impedance matching, and also things like analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters. Now you might not think of these immediately as being RF devices, but in fact nowadays we use analog to digital converters and digital analog converters at radio frequencies. So whereas in previous decades we might have taken an RF signal and reduced it in frequency to fall within the bandwidth of an A to D, now we often have A to Ds which are fast enough that they can directly digitize RF signals. So that makes an A to D and a D to A working at RF frequencies an RF device. And then we have all the issues associated with RF devices and circuits to account for when we work with these devices. And software-defined radio, the idea of implementing features of the radio in software as opposed to analog components, which has some advantages and also entails some additional problems. Uh, but is often attractive because it gives you the ability to modify the radio without modifying the components. It's easier to change software than to change hardware. There is also a dichotomy in the concept of an RF circuit between discrete circuit design and integrated circuit design. And these are both areas that are active within this field. Uh, certainly RFICs uh, entail a different set of problems when compared to discrete designs where you have a separate transistor, for example, a separate inductor, a separate capacitor. But both these things uh, exist in current systems and uh, are areas of active effort. The next realm that I'll address here is devices. And devices, I mean things like RFICs, these chips that contain a whole bunch of RF circuitry on them and are highly attractive, of course, because they're very, very small and potentially reduce cost and allow many more features, but at the same time introduce more problems and introduce some performance limitations. So there's a perpetual challenge here figuring out how to integrate RF functions onto uh, integrated circuit devices. Microstrip lines themselves are RF devices, and I showed you how they can be used to make a filter, but in fact, they can be used for many things including couplers and dividers and, and so on. They are not used merely to move signals around, but they actually become components within RF devices. Waveguides are RF devices. Uh, transistors, diodes, transformers, balans, these exist as devices in the RF realm as they do in lower frequency realms. But what's different is they have to meet different requirements. And so, for example, when we select an RF transistor, it has to be suitable for the frequency range that uh, we're operating in. And this often entails a different uh, set of candidate uh, components. MEMS stands for Microelectromechanical Systems. And RF MEMS are a relatively new way of making 
devices, which are very, very small. And this opens the door to a whole bunch of new capabilities, in particular, reconfigurable RF devices. Whereas perhaps in the past, it would be relatively difficult to have that configurability, or you'd have to build multiple parallel paths through a system to implement different functions. Antennas, of course, are important class of RF devices, as are radomes. Radomes are devices which go around antennas, protect them from the weather, or which, for example, in the case of radomes on aircraft, allow the antennas to be integrated into the airframe in a way that the antenna won't uh, be a source of drag or won't interfere with the aerodynamic features of the aircraft. RF SOC stands for RF System on a Chip. So as in many disciplines in electrical engineering, system on a chip is the idea of being able to integrate a whole bunch of things which are traditionally done as separate modules or separate components into one component on a chip. So you can think of this as a merging of RF technology with programmable logic technology. And then finally, physics. And by physics, I mean all the things listed here. So for example, propagation. That has to do with the way radio waves travel from a transmit antenna to a receive antenna. And this is obviously a very important thing to consider in the design of mobile radio systems, where you're trying to establish communications between mobile users and fixed base stations. Well, you need to know something about how effectively the radio waves are able to traverse a certain distance, and then what happens to them in that process. Is there multipath, for example? Separate from propagation, we can consider scattering. This is of interest both for propagation and things like radar. The effectiveness of a radar is determined by how well the thing being uh, tracked is uh, scattering the instant wave. Uh, link budgets, that term refers to the overall requirement for power in order to achieve a sufficiently good signal-noise ratio or uh, data rate for users of a radio communication system. Radio navigation itself is a physics problem. GNSS systems like GPS uh, do uh, time of arrival based navigation. That means you have to solve a whole bunch of simultaneous equations which have as input the uh, times of arrival. Radio astronomy itself is all about physics as is geophysical remote sensing. These are things I mentioned earlier. But also things like electromagnetic interference and electromagnetic compatibility. These are huge issues within the domain of RF and microwave engineering. And yet another one that you may not have thought about, hidden object sensing. Things like detection of unexploded ordnance, uh, ground penetrating radar, which is used to sense uh, metallic objects underneath the ground, uh, or seeing through walls which has applications in public safety. For example, police officers and firemen often have the need or the desire to know what is on the opposite side of a wall. So there are now systems emerging that use RF to sense what is on the other side of a wall. Okay, so why should you consider studying RF and microwave? Or why might you not want to? Um, well, I'd say the best reason for considering this area is because you find the applications that I've talked about interesting and you enjoy solving difficult and open-ended problems. Because if there's anything I found in common among all of our microwave engineering is that the problems tend to be relatively difficult and they tend to be open-ended in the sense that there is rarely a simple recipe for solving the problem and frequently uh, the work involves a lot of troubleshooting and dealing with unanticipated problems. Another reason for studying RF and microwave engineering is because, well, frankly, the employment outlook is consistently excellent. Year after year, uh, the demand for RF and microwave engineers is, is uh, much greater than the available supply. A third reason is because RF basics are timeless and they're relatively difficult to learn by self-study. Simply put, there's no better time to learn RF than as a uh, BS level student in electrical engineering. Trying to learn the essential 
elements of RF design and um, RF theory, once you're out of the program, is, is an uphill climb. I mean, it's not easy when you're a bachelor's level student, but it's certainly much more difficult if you have to do it on the fly. At the same time, I say these basics are timeless because RF uh, fundamentals don't really change over time. In RF, it's, it's pretty much the same principles every year. The capabilities change and the kinds of things that are possible change, but the fundamentals, once you learn them, will probably not change significantly over your career. Finally, let me mention that because RF is a broadly applicable skill set and not merely just one application area, these skills are highly desirable in other areas. So, for example, in any area that involves analog circuit design, for example, or digital microsystem design, or wireless communications, or medical systems, or power electronics, there are opportunities for RF engineering in every one of those areas because RF is about these higher frequencies where things behave a little bit differently. So whenever uh, these uh, frequencies get high enough, um, the, the need for somebody who understands RF principles uh, emerges, and they emerge in all these applications. So you should not be concerned that focusing on RF will somehow limit your options. I would say just the opposite is true. Uh, you might also think, well, you know, I'm not really a hardware person. Uh, maybe, maybe you're someone who prefers firmware or software design or those kinds of things, but you just kind of have this notion that RF is, is interesting as well. Well, it turns out that many jobs in RF involve no hardware. They are uh, analysis problems, uh, propagation analysis problems uh, fall in that category. Spectrum monitoring falls in that category. There are lots of opportunities in the RF microwave field for people who are primarily designing digital things or people who are developing software for various analyses. Students often have the impression or the fear that uh, what they're seeing in class might not be representative or applicable to what they do in the real world. And uh, I certainly am sympathetic to that uh, concern. And my suggestion is always this, is go out and look to see what uh, real RF engineers do. And one way to do that, that's very easy, is to keep an eye on trade magazines. So in the RF and microwave engineering area, there are a number of periodicals which serve the whole community. Uh, for example, Microwave Journal is one. Uh, microwaves and RF is another. Within the IEEE, there is a Microwave Theory and Techniques Society, which publishes a magazine called Microwave Magazine, which is something that undergraduate students can browse. And even though you might not understand the technical detail in all the articles, at least you can see what kinds of things people are working on, uh, not just in academia, but in industry. And so looking at these trade journals can give you an idea of generally what kinds of things people are working on, what topics are becoming hot, just generally, what are, what are people doing? And of course, in this era, YouTube is a way that you can learn more about what's going on. And there are some interesting YouTube channels I might suggest. For example, the YouTube channels of uh, industries, uh, companies that are working in the RF area. So for example, Analog Devices Incorporated has a YouTube channel where they um, talk about various RF uh, things that they're doing. Rogers Corporation has an interesting YouTube channel where they spend a lot of time talking about uh, the real nuts and bolts of RF engineering, and that can be very interesting and educational. The YouTube channel of uh, Keysight, which is an RF company, um, and there are probably many more, but the idea is that there are certainly ways that you can learn more about what is happening in practice in RF engineering, because all of the things I'm showing on the slide are really targeting primarily practicing RF engineers. So you can rest assured that you're seeing what is actually happening in the industry. So let me conclude this talk with the following idea. RF and microwave engineering is hard work. It's hard to learn and frankly, it's hard to do. Uh, this really isn't the right area for people who prefer to follow a recipe and people who expect things to work the first time. Uh, there are always unexpected problems. 
uh, things that have to be tracked down and resolved, and a lot of time and effort goes into doing that kind of thing. On the other hand, when you get your RF project to work, it's really exciting. And it's made even more exciting knowing that you've taken something which initially is very abstract and mathematical and theoretical and made it practical and useful. And there's just something about those everyday miracles that we work on in this business, like being able to send signals through the air without wires and radar and medical imaging, being able to see what is inside someone without actually cutting into them, all of those things. So that's what I mean when I say the hard work pays off. That concludes my talk on RF and microwave engineering.